Welcome to River of Life Online. Today we are looking uh, or continuing in, in our look at the story of Jacob. Today we're looking at him wrestling with God and we're looking at true conversion. Let's jump right into it now. Today we're looking at Jacob's experience after crossing the Jabbok River. Uh, let's first read that story from Genesis chapter 32 and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. During the night, Jacob got up, took his two wives, his two servant wives, and his eleven sons, and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. This left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? the man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel, because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. Well, as we look at Jacob's story, we can sometimes be a little overwhelmed by how many things have gone wrong in his life. Uh, we may even be a little overwhelmed by just how many bad decisions Jacob actually makes in this story. And yet, it's good for us to look at Jacob's life with all its problems because it reminds us that uh, the God of the Bible is the God of grace. He is the God who reaches out to people just like Jacob. A people just like you and me. Now, if we look back at the creation story, we remember these words by God, that it is not good for the man to be alone. And that's my first point today as we look at this story about conversion. You see, in the very beginning, God created human beings in his image, and he created us so that we wouldn't be alone. Often these words are taken within the context of marriage because of the actual story itself, and that is obviously a very good interpretation. But we also know that human beings are social creatures. We exist in groups. We exist uh, in relationship. Uh, you know, God was in relationship with Adam when he uh, saw that it wasn't good for the man to be alone. And, and while his, this primarily you know, is solved in creation by Eve, and, uh, and then the goal to be fruitful and multiply, you know, it's from these families that we see communities built, and ultimately entire societies. So it's not surprising that when the fall happened, the first place that the curse really hit uh, was that lack uh, of harmony in relationship, uh, that primary relationship between the man and the woman. Uh, but then, of course, in their offspring, in their children, and we see the very first murder taking place in the Bible, in Cain and Abel, the first generation uh, of Adam and Eve. And now, because of sin, everything is thrown into turmoil, shame, strife, blame, deception. I mean, all these things entered into the world at the fall, and they creep into the very fabric of our relationships. We were created to be in relationships, uh, first with God, and then, of course, with others. So it's not surprising that with sin entering into the world and into our own lives, that we have struggles in relationships, uh, perhaps relationship with God and re definitely uh, relationships with others. Uh, sometimes, you know, we may be tempted to retreat and to isolate because sometimes things get so hard. Yet what we read in this text is that true healing and true uh, sense of self comes in relationship with God and with others. 
At the end of the day, God has said that it's not good for us to be alone. And so we need to work out the wrinkles in our relationships, both with others and with God. And as we come back to the Jacob story, we're going to see this in real time in his life. And so let's look at this authentic encounter with God. You see, Jacob uh, named the place Peniel, which means face of God, as we read in Genesis 32, 30, because he had a face-to-face -face encounter with God. Jacob knew all about God. He grew up with Isaac, the miracle child, and he no doubt heard stories of his grandfather Abraham, who was called the friend of God. Uh, stories of his family would have been well known to Jacob, uh, as well as the promises that God had made. Jacob may well have even heard his mother tell him about how God had chosen him over Esau, uh, that the words, uh, the older will serve the younger, would indeed come true in his life. But for Jacob, he was more of a uh, spiritual person than perhaps a God-fearing person when we look at his life. You know, Jacob ex accepted spiritual experiences. He didn't rule that out. He had his dream about the ladder going to heaven. Um, he might have accepted those stories that his mother and uh, told him about being favored by God and definitely perhaps accepted all the stories about God working in the life of his father and grandfather. But Jacob didn't seem to connect the dots between, ex well, spiritual experiences and a changed life. It was the same Jacob who was, you know, hanging out with mom in the kitchen, manipulating his brother for the birthright, who wore a disguise to cheat his brother out of his father Isaac's blessing. And uh, it's the same uh, Jacob who we see here and now in this story, wrestling with this visitor in the night. You know, one scholar has noted that the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob involve real personal history, and that these stories stress that more important than sacrifice in the religion of the patriarchs is the fact that their worship involved personal encounter with God. This encounter with God is pictured as a wrestling match in verse 24 and 25 of our passage. You know, the same word that's used there is described, uh, is used to describe dust that's kicked up by a runner or by horses. Uh, I mean, it's a great image of two people, uh, you know, wrestling in the dirt and the, the dust cloud being kicked up around them. Now, obviously, the way language works, no one was thinking of dust when the word wrestling was used, but it does conjure up that in our minds, this idea of a very um, physical tussle uh, between these two men. And the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the word that's used here in this story is very similar to the word that Paul uses in Ephesians 6.12, when he says that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, our wrestling match, uh, our spiritual uh, close combat. This idea of a wrestling match or a physical context involving, you know, real struggle is really important for us to think about. This encounter with God is more than just a spiritual experience. It left a mark on Jacob's life. And from this point on, Jacob walked with a limp. Old Testament scholar Derek Kidner writes, his limping would be a lasting proof of the reality of the struggle. It had been no dream. Uh, there was a sharp judgment in it. What Jacob had was an authentic encounter with God. Calvin notes in the opening comments of his Institutes that the foundation of true religion is knowing God and knowing self. Uh, it's built into our spiritual DNA that we need to know God. But in doing that, in, in coming to know God, we also have to peer deeply into our own souls. You know, and we're reminded uh, of this in the story of, you know, of God picking up that uh, in Genesis 2, 4, you know, making a dirt statue of the first human and then coming up face to face and then breathes the uh, nefesh chaya into his, into his nostrils, uh, the breath of life. And 
and Adam, the dirt statue, becomes a, a living soul, a living being. Uh, and that's what Jacob experienced, a kind of that in this moment. He was wrestling. He, he comes to see this encounter as a face-to-face -face encounter, and he names the place Peniel, the face of God. But Jacob went away uh, with a limp, uh, but more than a limp. We see uh, the issue of identity once again in the story of Jacob, because you see, Jacob receives a new name. He's told, your name will no longer be Jacob. Uh, from now on, it will be called Israel. Now, what I find most interesting about this uh, name Israel is that it's really not something Jacob would have chosen for himself. I mean, who wants to be known as the person who is always fighting with God or who fights with God? You know, we want to be known as the one who obeys God, who, who champions for God, who surrenders to God, right? Not the person who is, you know, known for fighting with God. But in our more honest moments, perhaps, we'll see the reality not only in Jacob's life, but in our own, that it seems that fighting with God is something we're very good at. And, and tend to do a quite a bit. Uh, you know, we do the opposite of what God tells us. God says, forgive your enemies. We go to war with them. God says to give, if you have two things, give up one. But we hoard our possessions and we don't care about the poor. Our world is completely messed up because people haven't followed the basic uh, teachings of the Bible about loving our neighbor as ourselves and understanding that our neighbor is everybody, uh, even as Jesus teaches us in the story of the Good Samaritan, someone we may consider an enemy. Uh, but for us, I mean, as we look to this Jacob story, we, we are always reminded of Jesus Christ. And the Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ is our peace. All the, the battles that we have and that we create come to an end in Jesus Christ when we put our faith in him. Paul says that in Christ we are new creation. You see, we have our face-to-face -face moment with God. God breathes this, uh, this, uh, this breath of life into us. He gives us his Holy Spirit. And last Sunday uh, was Pentecost Sunday, the Sunday where the church celebrates and remembers that first experience of God pouring out his Spirit onto the world, that, uh, that fresh power to live a new way. And, and this was experienced in part by Jacob as he met with God and wrestled with God face to face. I was um, sent a video last week by, uh, that was done in, a long time ago on a program called Man Alive with uh, Roy Benestiel with Metropolitan Anthony Bloom. And so here we have this Orthodox scholar talking about his life before he was a Christian and the moment he became a Christian. And uh, now in my live uh, preach, uh, I actually played a bit of that video, but I, I don't think I can do that here because of copyright. So let me just say that in this story of this, this Russian Orthodox uh, archbishop, basically, he talked about his conversion and he, and he talks about how he was disgusted at a presentation that was given um, about Jesus. And he went home and he wanted to read the Bible to find out if what this person was saying was true. And as he began to read the Gospels, he had a sense of Jesus Christ right there across the table from him. He looked up, there was no one there, but he had this deep, deep sense that something spiritual had happened that God had actually showed up in his life. And I, when I watched that, I just, I, I couldn't help but think of my own story and my own experience coming to faith in Christ. How I was asked to, uh, on television by Billy Graham, giving an altar call, and how he uh, said, believe in Jesus, you've tried other things, try Jesus. And I thought, why not? And so I prayed and asked Christ into my life. And something happened to me in that moment, something that was deeply profound, uh, deeply life-changing, that no matter how many years have gone by and how many struggles and how many challenges, how many doubts have happened since then, 
uh, intellectually and uh, just just in life, I can always go back to that moment and I can say, I know that was real. I can remember that moment in my life where God showed up in a palpable way. And God does this. He did this in the story of Jacob. He does this in people's lives all around the world where God shows up and gives them that experience in their own lives, which is beyond argument. Someone could have said to the archbishop, to uh, uh, Metropolitan Anthony Bloom, that he was just had a psychological breakdown or he had some kind of a, uh, I don't know, he was making something up. But for him, as he looked back at that moment, that was a real experience with God. And when we read this story of Jacob, and we read about uh, his new name. Well, he took upon himself this new name. And, you know, people might have said maybe 20 years later, oh, Jacob, you know, he just got religion one day or something. But he had this limp. He had this memory of that experience of a face-to-face encounter with God that actually changed his life and changed his direction. And we need a change in direction in our lives. Just look at Jacob. What was happening in his life as this moment was going on, when this experience happened, when this this real encounter with God took place? He was looking at a reckoning, wasn't he? Jake, uh, Esau was coming. Esau with all of his clan. And of course, this meeting with Esau might go horribly wrong. Jacob was worried about the safety of his family. He didn't know how ang- angry Esau still was. Uh, how much Esau still hated Jacob. He didn't know. He had no contact. Uh, We see uh, this in Jacob as he faces the sins that he committed against his brother Esau. Uh, But meeting God face to face forced Jacob, as Calvin says, to look at himself in a fresh way, to see that many of his problems were rooted in his own character and his own choices. That He was as much to blame uh, for the chaos in his life as anything else or anyone else. But more than this, what Jacob saw was that he needed to restore his relationship with his brother. Or at least he had to do everything he could do to restore it. As Paul would say later to the Church of Rome, you know, as far as it's possible with us, uh, live at peace uh, with others. And in this case, with his brother. You see, God asked Cain this question, you know, where's your brother? And Cain snorts back, Cain, the murderer. He says, am I my brother's keeper? And of course, we know the answer to that question. Yes, yes, Cain, you are your brother's keeper. You were built and created, and it was not good for you to be alone. You need others. But Cain did the ultimate uh, sin against relationship when he murdered brother out of jealousy. You see, it's the implicit criticism that Jesus had for the Pharisees in the story of the prodigal son. The elder brother in that story, he didn't go looking for the lost son. The father loved the lost son. The father yearned to see the lost son again, and the elder brother never bothered to go looking for him. Uh, He even disowned his brother. You know, when we have this conversation in Jesus' story, Uh, The elder brother calls him this your son, not his brother, your son. You see, but when Jesus comes into the world, the perfect son, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He saw his father's love for the lost ones, and he made it his mission to seek them out. Seeing God face to face moved Jacob in the direction of being reconciled, brother. And so Jacob sends out gifts to Esau, and he, he, he sort of does this to soften the, the approach or to, to soften Esau's heart. But ultimately, uh, what Jacob learns is the simple truth that Derek Kidner points out in his commentary on Genesis. He says, Jacob would uh, soon discover grace, not negotiation, is the only solvent of guilt. The only thing that can wash away this stain uh, of guilt, of of the offenses that we have done to others and to God, is grace. And and so it is for us. Uh, You know, it's grace that 
uh, needs to exist at the very foundation of all relationships. God's grace toward us, uh, covering our imperfection and our brokenness, our failings, our, our stubbornness, uh, but then extending outward uh, God's grace through us into our relationship. You see, every one of us has experienced disappointment in others. And the fact is, when we peer deeply into our own souls, we can see that we have also been the cause of disappointment for others. And, and the answer for this, I mean, of course, we want to change our ways and do things better, but we can't change the past. We can't fix what was broken, what was done, the offense, the hurt, the guilt. What needs to happen there is an extension of the grace that we see in Jesus Christ. We need to actually accept the truth, the reality of Jesus' teaching, uh, that by the measure we measure to others, so too it will be measured to us. I don't know about you, but when I meet God face to face on that end day, that ultimate day, where God sort of recounts my life, what I've done, I want God to be gracious. I want God to be merciful. And because of his love for me and his gift of grace in Jesus Christ, I know that he will be. But I want my life here and now to be a demonstration of what I anticipate and what I hope for on that day. I want to extend grace and mercy to others. I want to do everything I can to be a person that extends that grace to build relationships, not tear them down. You know, God made us so that we would connect with him. God made us so that we would connect with others. And I suppose that's why the greatest commandments are to love God and to love others. It's not rocket science, right? I mean, it's like there's a connection or something. Uh, Jacob's story reminds us of how we need grace in our lives. We need to receive it, and we also need to extend it in our relationships with others. And so on this matter, Calvin was right. Uh, to, to know God requires that we also know ourselves. Uh, seeing ourselves, really seeing ourselves, opens our eyes to see the beauty of God's grace in fresh ways. And it's this beauty of grace that is extended to us by God and by others that we come to understand our need to extend this same grace to those around us so that others might also experience this beautiful, wonderful, amazing grace that is the foundation of our relationship with God and also binds all human relationships over time. But to get to this point, we all need conversion, that powerful and personal connection with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We need a new life going forward. This is what we see in part in Jacob's story, and it points us toward all that's possible for us because God has sent his Son to seek and to save us, the lost ones. He, he was sent to change our hearts and our souls so that we could experience real life, real life with God, and real life with each other, now and forever. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your grace that you reach out to men, women, and children, even in our time, and you you show us, you reveal to us just a bit of yourself so that our hearts are, are overwhelmed by your grace and your love and your power. And we ask, Lord, in this moment that you would do that for us once again, to remind us of that moment when you first came to us and revealed yourself to us, or to do that right now in this present moment. We pray, God, that you would reveal yourself to us in Christ and help us to have that encounter, that same kind of encounter that Jacob had, one that changes our lives. Forgive us our sins and help us going forward to live at peace with others. In Christ's name we pray. Relevant, practical, authentic, river of life.